Um, thank you. Um, I'm here to present on behalf of One Life. I'm not actually part of the project team, as you'll sort of see from that slide. I'm the only Welsh rugby supporter involved in the project. <laughs> part of the reason I'm here. And hopefully I can do the thunder necessary. Okay. <laughs> uh, so first of all, what is One Life? Um, this is the uh, centre twin, it's called Wellspring, um, that Bishop's Council approved about a year ago, which essentially commissioned this piece of work that's been going on now for about a year in different versions. So to read it out, it's a vision for transforming engagement with <coughs> children, young people and their families, through a pioneering network of fresh expressions in sports and wellness centres. Now when I've gone out, people have asked me what that really means, so I'll just focus on some of the words as we go through. So it's a vision, and I think that's important. We don't have detailed plans, we don't have all the answers, we don't have the full concept. And one of the significant differences between a vision and a strategy is a strategy is sort of pushing you a little bit and crying you in, whereas a vision is hopefully enlivening you and encouraging you onward. It's a pull concept, not a push concept. Ooh. There's a clear focus for this activity, it's not exclusive, but there is a focus on children, young people and families. That's the big area of concern within our church mission, and therefore that's right at the focus for what One Life is seeking to do. It's a pioneering network, that's one that gets people. What does the pioneering network mean? Well, pioneer ministers typically are not shaped by parochial boundaries. So we are going to have forms of church that are not constrained by parochial boundaries, which will mean things like BMOs, it will mean that we need good and honest conversations and discussions with local incumbent clergy and other layers and theatres um, in each context in which we're working. And hopefully if you've had any encounter with the One Life team, you'll understand that conversation happens right at the start. It's also a network, so these different places are going to be connected and interrelated. There will be a common purpose of mission across all of them. They won't simply be a series of points of light, there will be a connected structure. Fresh expressions. Hopefully everyone in the room roughly knows that means it means we will worship in different and new ways. We think because of the nature of this being a pioneering network is some of those new ways of worship will be much more new than some of the new ways of worship we've previously seen under fresh expression. <coughs> some of which, it's arguable, might not be recognisable by some traditional Christians. Having said that, as I'm sure Bishop Robert would make sure we affirm, actually baptism and communion are core sacraments of any worshiping community. And therefore we do need to make sure that this isn't just fluff, this is genuinely new worshiping communion. Quite your word, is it, Bishop? <laughs> <laughs> Sorry? Yes, yes, yes. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, and then finally, there's a focus within this on sports and wellness, on physical activity, and I'll come on to why a little bit later on. But there is actually a particular USP, if you like, when describing this externally, and that will look like sports and fitness. Uh, in, and that is something that we focused on in the Life Vision. You'll be aware of the Sports Priority Group particularly. Um, and it is something that we think is worth investing further and more heavily in as we take this forward. So the second question is, where has it come from? Well, it's come out of the Life Vision. The life vision, as you know, came from that deep listening exercise that we undertook three years ago. 2016. Yeah, so three years ago. Um, and that listening exercise has continued as we have lived out this life vision. It has continued through the, the priority groups that we've had, it's continued through the visits that senior clergy and others do around the parishes, and hopefully it's continued in your parishes as well. We're continually responsive to what we feel is bubbling up, where the Holy Spirit is leading us across this diocese. And because it comes from that, it has those core components of life. We are responding to leadership. We need genuine Christian <coughs> leadership. We need to nurture and develop that. We need it to be networked. We need it to be diverse. We need it to be liberated to lead in the way in which people are called to lead. We need to show genuine imagination in how we respond to our current context and how we share the gospel in this generation. We must never forget the faith element of the life vision, and we need to make sure we are genuinely engaging with people where they are. We are called by Christ to go, they are not called to come. <coughs> we must be clear that we are responsible for going and engaging with people where they are every day. So why do we need this? 
pluses and minuses. So firstly, the church has faced decades of decline. I think you'll often be told this is often portrayed as decline in church attendance. And I think we need to slightly unpick that because I think that's a very insular view of the problems that the church has faced in its decline. These three charts all come from British social attitudes. Hopefully you can roughly see them. The black line is no religion. The red line is Anglican identity. And the timeline is roughly from 1990, they're slightly different the charts, 1990 to about 2012, 2013. And you can see, when I was 18, in 1990, the biggest group was Anglican. Over 40% of the population identified themselves probably as Church of England rather than Anglican. Um, and that was only in 1990, it wasn't a huge time ago. That number has decreased to just over 20% few years ago, and it's probably slightly lower now, certainly. You'll see the identity of those with no religion has shot up over that period of time. The other interesting line is the green line, the third line down. That's other Christian denominations. The identity of other Christian denominations has increased over that period. So when we talk about the decline of Christianity in England, there's quite an Anglican shape to that decline, certainly in terms of identity. And we need to be honest and understand that, and that's about <coughs> Second question is about upbringing. <coughs> this is how people believe they were brought up, what faith they were brought up in. Now, obviously, this is a much longer time lag than identity, because this is where you came from rather than where you are now. And again, the red line is Anglican, the black line is no religion, the green line is other Christian. And again, you can see that relatively steep decline over a relatively short period of time of Anglican identity, or sorry, Anglican upbringing. And that's about the confidence of Anglican parents to raise their children and share their faith with those children. And that confidence has obviously been in sharp decline, bear in mind this is all of the generations at once. So if you think of what's happened to the youngest generation within that profile, it's extremely sharp. Again, if you look at the green line, it's up. So actually, there's not a lack of confidence in all Christian denominations to share and raise their children in their particular tradition. There are complexities, obviously, around immigration and Roman Catholic poles and all that sort of stuff, but broadly speaking, we shouldn't see this as a general Christian issue. The confidence of no religion to bring their children up, atheists, is remarkably growing and strong. And that, to me, is the scariest thing. It's actually all those children who have no understanding of faith in part of their upbringing. The last one is church attendance. So this is the one we always think of as the big declining number. This is slightly debunks the myth that everyone used to go to church. The black line, with a slight quirk, where apparently the data is corrupt, um, shows that people never went to church, is the black line. They never went to church. 60% people never went to church or any place of worship. And that's hardly changed over the period. That's, that's roughly the number we're looking at throughout it. Again, if you look at the red lines, this doesn't distinguish us Anglicans from all Christians. If you look at the weekly attendance, people who go to church every week, it's slightly up over that period of time. So I think in terms of focusing our concerns and our malaise on people don't come to church anymore, I think we need to think that's not really where the problem is. The problem is around identity and upbringing, not around the fact they don't come along on a Sunday morning. So this one, you've probably seen various versions of this, but this articulates that problem over identity and that one. Nearly 70% of our churchgoers, congregations, of course you don't use members in the church movement, um, are, are over 55, and actually that profile goes up the age of, higher up the age of 30 go. <coughs> but this is under 35. It's down to about 10% of our churchgoers are in the bottom, roughly the bottom half of what we'd expect the change profiles to be. We are genuinely failing to get those younger generations to come to church. We know we are failing to get those younger generations to come to church, but if we ask why, then we need to look back to that previous slide. Third why, there's lots of whys, is what we talked about at the last synod, about the sustainability of our current model. As you will recall, and we'll be up to see in minutes if you don't recall, we have essentially lost, invested, spent, whatever you want to say, around a million pounds a year for the past decade, and we have ended up here. 
in a place that doesn't look much like a thriving, growing, successful model of church. And as you recall, the, the, the roads are where there seems to be a significant problem, and over 70% of our benefices have over three reds. And sadly, most of those reds are actually the missional reds rather than the financial reds. It's actually our missional malaise is worse than our financial malaise at the benefice level. So our current model arguably isn't working, and we're spending a lot of money keeping that model not working. Secondly, <clears throat> there's a genuine social need out there that actually we are, as a society, struggling. And that's coming up in all kinds of different ways and hopefully you can recognise all of those three points. If you live in a market town in the Cotswolds, you probably don't have a bank anymore and your shops are probably struggling, closing, the church might take them over North Beach. Um, but broadly speaking, we are seeing our, our, those things that used to be normal in smaller communities and local communities are now disappearing. Just the basic incidental bumping into parts of life are going. There is a rising and escalating sense of isolation, of mental health. Some people blame social media, and that's I think a bit unfair just to blame one thing. But there is a sense that people don't feel connected and joined in. Well, how can a, how can a gospel community flourish when there is no community to flourish in? How are we going to genuinely share that gospel when the basic mechanics on which we hope to work with don't really exist anymore? And then, as Bishop Rachel touched in the political environment, gen people are much more angry. There is a sense of division that actually the gospel should be there and speaking into confidently. And finally, coming back to sports. So less than 1% of our teenagers are in church each week. But 55% of those teenagers are doing sports out of schools. So they're not counting school where they have to do it. This is where they're choosing to go there. That's what that looks like graphically. So in terms of where the children are, they're doing sports. And that sense Christ told the disciples to cast their nuts over the other side, because there were more fish there. Not because they had better nets or better casting technique, but because there were simply more fish there. And that arguably is the challenge that we have, is, is that's actually the community activity that most children want to join in with, is sports. They also want to do Xbox games and stuff, that's not quite so good for community building. <laughs> and the other bit which we have successfully proven, uh, effectively proven over the past uh, year or more, and actually with Psalms to Legacy with John and Helen in the room, um, over a much longer period of time. Sports is a really effective way of engaging with young people. It does work. And that's a, I became the sponsor of the sports group, and, and I think it's quite funny. I think I've got, in the end, almost a tele evangelism about how great it was. Because it was genuinely fantastic to see the outcomes from this compared to a lot of the other stuff we were, we were trying to stretch and build. You could say, I don't look like a sports party leader, but it works. <coughs> so a couple of bits from their work. The sports party group engaged with, actively engaged with, with a gospel message, the same number of children as all of those who came to Church of England services in the mission stats across the rest of the church. That doesn't obviously include the excellent work that goes in our schools. But that other church engagement with was the same as all of our church activities added together as reported in mission stats, except for the complications of them. The more exciting bit, from my point of view, is those children, when asked afterwards, looks like a high percentage of unchurched, would they wish to engage? In virtually every event, 80% or more said they would wish to be more, and more involved with the church if this is what church looks like. And around 60% where if this is sort of what church is, they'd love to come regularly. They would love to say they belong to church. So that the, the investment, which was relatively speaking peanuts in, in the work that this was done, shows that we are having huge numbers of children, not just coming and having a nice time, but hearing the gospel message, understanding it's a gospel message, and wanting to hear and do more of it. And that's quite exciting. We, obviously, we, we look at what other diocese are doing. Some diocese have spent a lot of money on, on youth workers to network and connect. We got more from running about a dozen events last year on a structured sports mission program with science workers involved in most stuff. We got more children committing to wish to be involved in church than they did through, through over, a, I think they had something like 15,000 contacts, and our sports group had less than 1,000 contacts in those things. It's the, it's the depth of engagement you can get with those that, that produces the exciting results. So, how are we going to take this forward? Bishop's Council in June received a report called Project Wellspring, because it was called Wellspring in those days, 
Um, and the piece of work that's now ongoing, there was, it was a, um, it was a document, I think, where it said Fair Say Bishops Council were very affirming with the vision, but were quite a bit concerned about some of the details and mechanics of the reality. And so how do you turn that vision into a strategy? So they've been given, not expected to read these, by the way, don't mind. <laughs> so they've been given a list of, of 15, actually it's 14 originally, and a 15th one proposed on the, on the meeting, 15 different strands of work to take forward to start to get into the nitty gritty of how this is going to be resourced, enabled, enacted. And that's the, the work that the One Life team are going on with now. These next two slides will be much better done by Tim Hasey Smith, but just pretend I'm Tim at the moment. So we've got a question about what mission might work, might look like, and these are meant to be illustrative, and I realise these things are always slightly flawed, and I'll come to some of the flaws I finish on them. So this is a model of what youth work might look like. So you have this, what you might call a kind of thumb, a filter at the top, which is quite a narrow stretch. So you're, so you're bringing down a relatively narrow group of people, and then you have this, this cloud of engagement, where youth work can be weaker, is it brings a general sense of warmth and fondness towards the church, but actually it's not very structured or intentional. It's just a sense you like the church a bit more. And then out of that, and this is uh, you know, particularly um, recognised in the work the Psalms does, but other work does as well, there's a really strong youth leadership programme. So that bit at the bottom is a really strong and effective strand in, in growing young leaders. And the risk of youth work, fundamentally, is we're going to a narrow group of extra people. People are quite close to the church already, and we're not really structuring our engagement with them. It's a, it's a bit too generic, a bit too general, we're nice people. The other way in which we're currently doing a lot of work is obviously with schools. Now in schools, we have a much wider scope of people we're connecting with, so that top bit is much more structured. The way in which we engage with them is, a, is sometimes a bit mechanical. It's a bit of going through a process. It's also not fundamentally a process about growing disciples. It's a process about educating young children. So it can be a bit of a machine that we don't control. And then the outcomes are essentially the lots of different bits. You get many more people have had a good engagement with the church and have started a discipleship journey. But the great shame, particularly in this diocese, is all primary school. So they're all much shorter outcomes. So it kind of, it's really good, but slightly half formed that discipleship journey for young people. There are exceptions, hence there is a, an exception line on there. There will be exceptions to that, but we have a great engagement of a fantastic group, but if you go to those, Year six leaver services, they're marvellous and really confident young people, happy with the gospel. If you turned up two years later, you probably wouldn't have the same experience with the same group of children, and they wouldn't have the same level of confidence as a group of Christians together. One life in its approach are seeking to have that sense of the school service for the whole community, the sense they're reaching the genuine 95% of the community, not the 10%. They want to produce a series of engagement, the honeycomb structure that was meant to show up, a kind of structured series of engagement where there's a complement series. It's something like my father's house, there are many mansions. There are lots of places that you can engage and feel comfortable in, but there's a sense of relationship and structure there. But it's not a machine, it's not going to force any onwards. And then the hopeful outcome, very optimistic outcome as you can see, is that actually we grow many more and many more confident disciples for a much longer period of time. So they will be fully <coughs> confident going out into the world. One of the biggest concerns we have about these illustrations, including this last one, is they feel a bit like you're kind of you're pulling people in and dragging them through. And again, this is about a go mission, not about a come mission. We're not trying to force people down a funnel into this. We're going to place the church where they are in their context. So moving on to what church might be, what that fresh expression might be. And um, within the report and being teased out further, there's reference to a, a piece of work called Seven Sacred Spaces by a chap called George Lings, that some of you may be familiar with. And this seeks to articulate the different purposes of different parts of the ancient monasteries and abbeys, and how actually all together they help form a Christian community, and fundamentally a church is a Christian community. And so one life of looking at these different spaces, so there's the refectory, the place where you go and eat. It's not simply the place you go and eat, it's where you go and eat in company and relationship and where the gospel is heard, literally in the ancient monastery, but actually where the gospel is very much present with people. So one of the things we need to think about, what is the sense of church that, that there is <coughs> that sense of community, eating together, relating together over food? 
a sense of service, of, of work. Actually, monasteries were working places where people worked, and actually these, these Christian communities need to be working to serve their community in practical ways. <coughs> There needs to be a place to learn, to explore, to, to deepen our faith and understanding, but also potentially to learn other life skills. Actually, a lot of the children and young people we're hoping to engage with, they might not be working with the current academic system. So actually, if we're going in with this sports and wellness agenda, we will be meeting kinesthetic learners, a nice phrase I've learned along the way, um, people who learn physically and practically as they go along. And if we're working with these people, actually, maybe we don't just have to teach them about the gospel, we might need to teach them about other life skills. So the fact that these will hopefully be social enterprises, centres that we look after and run, there will be opportunities to get coaching badges in sports, there will be opportunity to learn life skills in serving in, in the refectories, the cafeterias, the canteens, they run. There will be a place to decide, there's a sense, this is the, uh, the chapter house, the place of decision, but the sense there's a sense of community ownership and leadership and decision. Um, and Jenny and I, who uh, both belong to the Grace Network, uh, what work they're doing down at BMO in the Stroud area. They're doing fantastic work in trying to get genuine people <coughs> buy into decision making. The sense the church decides together. We try and do that with PCCs and hope that works really well with some of your PCCs. But actually that corporate sense of ownership and leadership is really important to how the church should look. Place of encounter, the chapel. There does actually need to be active worship in these places and that's not the kind of the fluffy stuff, but the genuine, deep and spiritual experience. And we are very confident that young people, children and families are crying <coughs> for that spiritual experience of good-led worship in a holy place, a holy chapel. And then there is the cell, the place of reflection, sometimes on your own, but always in relation to others, to understand, internalise and deepen your learning. And actually that's the, the place of deep discipleship. This will really work when we get those deep discipled young men and women leading out into their communities and that sense the cell is them in the world not them cell locked away somewhere else. Those who can count, let's hope that can now again, um, we'll notice that's only six. The other place is the cloister and we think this is part of the missing part within it. It's the white space between and around and in this. It's the place where we incidentally meet and encounter people in a sense of enjoyment and fun and not great expectation. I think one of the difficulties sometimes of Christian mission with those we meet is we can seem too expectant all the time. The worst example we'll all acknowledged is that you know the chaps on the cross preaching and calling people to come and be transformed instantly. Sometimes it happens and that's marvellous, but we don't always need to have that deep sense of expectation everywhere. We should be ready for it when the Spirit moves people, we should be there with the Spirit in our hearts, but actually it's fundamentally a place simply to meet and get to know people. And that's where we think sports is really effective, as we get to meet and know people and then we can take them to a further and deeper relationship. And, and to be clear, church is all of these places. We believe all of these places sit badly as church. If you join and you come along to the refectory regularly, you engage properly with what is on offer there, you are part of the church. Maybe not fully formed and doing everything, but you are part of the church and you belong to it. And we want to have further that time. I'll speed up now a little bit. So the One Life team, we have Tim, who was previously National Director of Script Union and Head of Dean Close, he's the project lead. Uh, David, who's the project manager, he's the chap who does this, you know, he works out what we're actually going to do, does the spreadsheets, challenges, discipline, all that marvellous stuff we need in the project team. Uh, he actually worked with Tim as the MD of Script Union uh, and has been a fantastic asset since he came in September. Uh, Chris Priddy, uh, Chris is on secondment to us in Bristol Diocese, he's the head of their parish resources and external relations. And he also ran Swindon Youth for Christ. And his, his skill set is really about understanding how to deliver youth work locally, all the challenges and problems and logistical challenges that come to that. And then Richard, who was the leader of the sports party group with, with uh, Rob French. Um, again, another script union, we pitched two of them. And those four together form the core team. Bishop Rachel will tell me off, and if I don't mention the fact, it's very obvious they are all roughly the same age, all the same gender, all the same colour. Which is why we need to point out, these are the project team, they come with their skills and diversity, but they work within a much wider context of people. And these are all people who are actively engaged in pursuing one or more different strands of the life vision. And they, they come everywhere from uh, Marcus Andrew, in the middle of black and white, who's a professor, was a professor until recently at the University of Gloucester, who comes with a fantastic academic rigour and will work on our monitoring and evaluation programmes around it. Uh, to Emily, who came with us uh, in 
um, who came to us on the internship programme at the Sports Writer Group around last summer. She works with Psalms at the moment, and she's leading on a brilliant programme called Active RE, uh, which is where we put sports alongside RE in a school context. The schools love it because they kind of get two for one in terms of teaching and learning. The children love it because it's a much more fun way of learning RE, probably sport as well, but definitely RE. Um, and it builds a relationship with the local church and community. So all of these people are delivering different aspects of that online vision. Where? Well, we're currently looking in detail. The report identifies three initial centres. Barney Hill down in the forest, Cooper's Edge on the edge of Gloucester, so that's rural, suburban, and then urban in the Oasis Centre, which is West Cheltenham, right next door to the old St. Anthony's Church, which was taken down. Uh, and we're into fairly detailed discussions there about exactly what it means, so we are quite practical in those places. That said, over the past, I'm not sure why that's popping up, these are all the other places that are starting to come into conversation with the One Life team. Most of these have come from the ground up. We haven't gone out and looked for new and additional places. These are the ones that have come up over the past year to 18 months and said we've got something really exciting, it's very close to what you're doing, can we have a conversation? And in many of them, they are, they are the sports and community centres either in their, existing in their local community, which is the case in February, where there's a bit of conversation going on, or they are new centres that are planned to happen, but no one's got any idea who's going to run them, what's going to happen, who's going to lead them, and that would include Innsworth, I think Jackie's in there, which is. Um, so Innsworth, where uh, Nathan from Sarms has been doing some great work with the Sports Writer Group over the past 18 months, um, and there's a new community plan there, new sports centre, no one has any idea what to do with it. So we're hoping to go in there and have a conversation with the planners and the developers and say, we would like to lead this community in this place, in this way. When our well, Bishop's Council commissioned this June, the team was formed over the summer. We're here, roughly in the middle. Um, and so the plan, you'll see the team has recently come in. They've got to this stage, at the moment there's obviously more detailed plans from what I'm interested in. Um, they're originally given until June next year to report back. They're actually going to try and bring that forward to April. They think actually they want to if you like, to spend out and work quicker because they think the answers can be got too quick and Bishop's Council want a decision. And they're trying to give that decision. The original plan was possibly a, quite a big initial investment and they're trying to make it a bit more gradual so that Bishop's Council have more chance to refine and control the programme as it develops out. What can we do now? We can do these three things, if you will. And um, so, pray. This is fundamentally a Christian programme, and all Christian programmes need to be rooted in prayer, or they will fail. Um, you can pray individually, and that would be great welcome. There was, an, and, uh, there, was a, sorry, there was a monthly gathered prayer in the Rock in Cheltenham, and you'll be very welcome to join in that. From memory, I'm going to get this wrong, I think it's the second Wednesday of every month they're meeting, um, but effectively that will be on the Darcy website, and you can get in contact with me or Tim Hasty smith and we can confirm the dates for those meetings. Um, hopefully it's a very vibrant and exciting place to go and join in with. If you're able to, you'll be very welcome. And uh, Catherine Warren of the Commons Department, oh, Catherine, yeah. Catherine, Clamp, sorry. Uh, Catherine Clamp will be sending out monthly bulletins of prayer that will be the whole life vision, but actually will also include praying particularly for this one life vision. You can act. All of this idea, all of this concept, all of the places we're looking at have come up from local communities, looking locally, understanding locally, and coming forward and saying, can we work with you, can we join in, can we understand this? So if you can reflect on your local context and what's possible, that'd be fantastic. And finally, if you can give talents and treasure, treasure's always welcome, but actually talents, we're trying to galvanise those who feel they have a real vocation, but haven't worked out how that best fits into the church. If you'd like to have a conversation with Tim, who's the project lead, about how you can see, I, could, I really understand, I really understand buildings management, I really understand net, netball or hockey or something, I really understand something that fit into this, please do have a conversation with Tim. Again, we're hoping to get all the talents of the church working together behind this. And we've got a fabulous group of people, we've got people who join the Bishop's Council in order to help deliver this vision. So we hope that if you feel you've got something to offer, you will. Thank you, and I'll probably overrun you, so.